The following interview was conducted with Robert E. Stroud, Director Emeritus, Purdue University Airport, on for the Purdue University Oral History Program. This is part two. It took place uh, Tuesday, June 22, 2010, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Good afternoon, Mr. Stroud, and thank you very much. Good afternoon. We will continue on, talk a little bit about the airport's role in the community and anything on the potty if you didn't, if you had anything additional on that. Yeah, You want the uh, airport's yeah, role that would be in the community? Yeah, community, yeah, right. Because yeah. one of the things that I quote was the airport's role in the community has become vital for growth, both the business and, say, the Purdue community. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the most telling thing was uh, several years ago uh, when uh, the Aviation Association of Indiana uh, was trying to get state funds in support of airport development and we went down to the lieutenant governor's office and uh, there were about uh, four or five of us and uh, all from Purdue no from all other? from all around the state okay from the uh, aviation association and uh, the Lu lieutenant governor of course uh, uh, gets uh, probably a thousand requests for support every day so he was not a, an easy sell and uh, so finally I pulled out a letter I had from a local uh, industrialist and that letter said quite flatly no qualification that if the Purdue University Airport had not been in that community, he would not have located his company here. He needed a good sized major airport. Uh, I showed that to the Lieutenant Governor and he made a 180 degree turn. He says, okay, what do we need to do? Because the idea of a company coming because you had an airport and that company which now is international and and recently has 150 local employees uh high salaried employees uh turned him around real quick so uh you know that sort of thing uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, to get support for uh, airports for the airport development. Right now we've got an instance up uh, uh, northern uh, part of uh, this part of Indiana where they want to close a general aviation airport because they want to put windmills in. And the, the presence of the airport negates having windmills within a certain distance. Uh, so they want to close the airport. Well, it's a small airport, has about uh, 25 airplanes. Uh, but the question is, who owns the airplanes and what are the airplanes doing? You could have one airplane coming in once a week supporting a company in that community that would be so invaluable. And we can look around at the uh, communities around us and we can see that effect. So they're going to have to take a close look at that. Uh, we have always had uh, good support from the community. Uh, at one time, as you look back, uh, there were three airports. There was the Eretz Airport owned by the Eretz family, uh, Cap Eretz, uh, who was actually the first manager of the Purdue University Airport. He worked closely with Amelia Earhart. Yes, he and, he and Amelia were, uh, were close friends. Right. And uh, then uh, we had the Halsmer Airport. The Halsmer brothers were sort of in the in the category of aviation uh, uh, 
enthusiasts and pioneers. Uh, one of them actually flew international air cargo. Uh, uh, the others uh, stayed here and uh, ran the airport and flight instruction and that. Their airport uh, ultimately got absorbed by the, the land of SIA. Uh, their airport had to be closed because uh, of the SIA plan. Uh, the Eretz family uh, just finally uh, gave it up. Uh, Cap's son, Don, died of a heart attack. Uh, his wife carried on for a while and, uh, and just realized that it was more work and more trouble than it was worth. And so she retired. And right now the uh, airport is sort of an industrial site. And part of it's going to be part of the Hoosier Heartland, I think, is the way it's laid out. Uh, so that's the, pretty much the history of aviation uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the area. Now, I probably have diverted what was the original question. No, the, both the community you're talking about and then, of course, yeah. the Purdue community. Those are the two big yeah. things, community-wise. The, the business community has always been very supportive. The only time we have not had 100% support, and it was really a negligible incident, uh, we were doing a master plan study, and uh, Jim Reilly, mayor of, of Lafayette, wanted to have the uh, consultants include in the study uh, the possibility of a new general aviation airport for Lafayette. And we said, sure, no problem as far as we were concerned uh, because we knew what the result would be. Uh, but Jim had a problem, and until I talked to him about it quite a bit, I didn't find out what it was, but he was the mayor of the only second-class city in the state of Indiana that did not have an airport. His city did not have an airport. Their, their own. Their own airport. And their own, on their own land. That's right. And so that was very much a sort of a, a little bit of a sore point with Jim. Uh, but on the other hand, we never wanted to do anything that Jim did not support. He was, he was very good at that. And, uh, but that was kind of a funny thing that popped up. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. You wouldn't uh, think about that. When you think the close proximity wouldn't, there are two cities it's together. Whatever. Yeah, this, this is, a, that Purdue Airport is the airport for uh, uh, six counties. That's right. That's the counties that are within our, right. our area. But, uh, no, that was that was uh, unusual, and uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, the chamber for years, uh, well, almost twenty years, uh, transportation committee and, uh, and government relations committee, mm -hmm. and that. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, you know, we always had one hundred percent support from the chamber, and uh, because they they realized. Uh, that having that airport there was important for industry, commerce. Uh, you could uh, look out on the apron any day and you, and you might see a Caterpillar airplane. Or, uh, originally, Anheuser-Busch was in here a lot. Uh, Augie number three, who is right now uh, the head of uh, Anheuser-Busch, who is now combined with somebody else. The Belgian uh, it, company book. Yeah. And but uh, he, he's a pilot, and he would fly their corporate jet in here. And a uh, terrific guy, just was a friend with everybody. And, uh, and, of course, my crew used to like to see him because when he flew in and and uh, he said, you guys always give me a great service here. He, and he'd tell a co-pilot, he said, go get a few cases out of the back and give these guys some cases. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
we get that. And we got special privilege uh, once of uh, uh, up close and personal with the with the horses when they were here once, and uh, and that's an experience too. Uh, uh, they but, live a very good life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, the the corporate uh, community uh, in uh, the Greater Lafayette area has been su supportive any time we ask for their help. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, one instance uh, uh, where we, we were going for a, a hearing, uh, and public hearing, and the w ones who were going to object, of course, are right there, and they sign up on the sheet first, you know. So I talked to some of the local uh, industrialists, bankers, and it turned out that uh, when we were ready to go to the hearing, five of them were ready to speak on our behalf. So I made out the list and I took it to the hearing officer. And he asked me who they were and I told him, and he said, okay. So he called them first. <laughs> and they got up and when you've got a couple of bankers and a mayor and and a couple industrialists up there saying how important this project is. He got around, uh, when they finished, he said, now uh, we can go through the rest of this list. Uh, nobody else spoke. The issue was settled. Sure. So uh, once again, you know, 100% support from sure. them yeah. and support that really mattered. Um, and at the right time. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And there was no hesitation on their part. And so that was always good. The big problem for us community-wise uh, has always been the air service issue. Uh, we were in very good shape until the Congress decided to go with deregulation. In 78. Aviation was one of the first. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, the railroads, trucking, and the rest of them ended up in what they thought was going to be heaven. But now you have a bunch of airlines headed up by people whose only decisions were what are the flight attendants uniforms going to look like, what color are we going to paint the airplanes, and what kind of snacks and meals are we going to serve on the airplane. Because prior to deregulation, they could not arbitrarily say, I want to fly here, I want to fly there. Uh, I want to go at this time, I want to go at that time. They didn't have that freedom. They had to go to what was then the Civil Aeronautics Board, uh, which was dissolved by the, by the law. And they had to get permission to fly from Indianapolis to Denver. And they had to file a document proving their case, uh, which were like two inches thick. All the financials and all the service and, and proving the need and how it's not going to hurt any other airline. And of course, every other airline that was flying to Denver would file against it. So it would take six to eight months to airline. get that route approved or right, disapproved. To get it approved or disapproved. Sure. And there was no question about airline fares. Uh, the fares were approved by the CAB. If you wanted to increase your fare, you had to essentially prove a hardship. Uh, that you couldn't make it at that. Now, 
If United wanted to increase their fare to New York, uh, the CAB would say, well, no, TWA is flying that for this. Why can't you? So again, documents, proof. So if they approved it, let's say they approved it from $300 to $350, that was the fare from Chicago to New York which meant that's what every other carrier there had to charge. However, the CAB said if you're making more than a 6% return on your, on your money, you've got to lower your fares. So what did these airlines do? Uh oh, we're going to be making 7%. Everybody gets a raise. That's what led to the, the comment, I don't know if I mentioned to you before, the reason for the hump in the 747 is provide room for the captain to sit on his wallet. Uh, but that's why, why the airline crew uh, uh, salaries just escalated. And uh, because nobody wanted uh, to have to give back any money or anything else, uh, you or weren't going to do they already had approved. That's right. Sure. Uh, so it was, it was a real complicated mess. Now, when they declared deregulation, and they said, okay, on, I think it was on February 1, there are a lot of these route segments that have been approved, but are not being served. So we're going to open the door, and any airline that wants to come in can come in and pick whatever they would like. One week before that date arrived, a United Airlines vice president showed up with a lawn chair sitting in the hallway outside the door of the Civil Aeronautics Board. Panic, the whole industry. United was the giant. They're sitting there waiting. So by the end of the week, the, the whole corridor was filled with lawn chairs with vice presidents sitting in. Now the, the final day came, and United went in, and they picked one community they wanted to serve that they hadn't had before, just one. And they left. All the others are going in. Frontier. Uh, and one other just went hog wild. One of them picked 60 route segments. 30 of which they didn't have stations at. And so they had to establish stations at these 30 communities, hire all these people, get the airplanes to serve these routes. And we all know what happened to airlines like Braniff and uh, Frontier TWA. TWA, Pan Am. Uh, what, what we had was the case of, as I mentioned, all they were concerned with before was uniforms, food, and movies. And all of a sudden, I likened it to when Lincoln freed the slaves. And he said, okay, you people are free. You can go where you want. You can go do what you want. And the slaves who had had absolutely no opportunities looked around and said, well, how do we go someplace? We walk or, or what? We can go get a, 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 any job we want. We, all we know is picking carton or taking care of the animals. What do we do now? Well, it was the same thing with the airlines. They were free to do whatever they wanted. 
and we know what a what a mess that has turned the airline industry into uh, because all of a sudden they we're we're free to do what, what we want how do we do it it's and, a whole new ball game hmm? whole new ball game oh yeah mm. it was it was a completely new world a world they, they had never even seen let alone operated sure. in and of course it was the worst thing that could have happened to the airline industry the worst thing that could have happened to a lot of communities including the greater Lafayette community because in our case United could no could now pick all sorts of destinations they were serving Fort Wayne not a big deal not for United Airlines they were pulling out of Fort Wayne we were served at that time by Air Wisconsin mm -hmm. we had nine flights a day Chicago excellent service Air Wisconsin looked at Fort Wayne and said look at all the passengers they're giving up Air Wisconsin put some of their inventory over there to Fort Wayne we lose a couple of flights other options came around and then at the same time the slot system was put into place at the major airports now the slot a slot is the right to land or take off from a given airport at a given time every day of the week so if you wanted a to take a, a flight into Chicago at 1 p.m. you had to have a 1 p.m. arrival slot and if you wanted to turn the airplane around and go out at 145 you needed a departure slot for 145 out of Chicago now <clears throat> all of a sudden these slots became quite valuable you had to buy the slot that's right okay that's right you paid the government sure. the government uh, got the money for the slots but all of a sudden the slots became negotiable instruments if you will Uh, the slots eventually reached a value of five million dollars a piece now if you can try to justify being able to fly into Chicago at 105 every day of the week and paying five million dollars for that right they did that's a big hug anyway they're anticipating a big business that's right and so the trading and buying and selling of slots uh, it, it, it became like a, 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 a stock market sort of thing you know I mean they these these times had value technically the slots belonged to the government but the government had assigned them to airlines so they were essentially a negotiable instrument and uh, <clears throat> Air Wisconsin had quite a few slots yeah. and hmm? at O'Hare okay. uh, but as they started branching out and uh, their route structure uh, they were <clears throat> serving major points other than O'Hare they had some slots I didn't need really at O'Hare yeah I think the final number was that Air Wisconsin made about 50 million dollars selling slots uh, United bought quite a few of them. but all of this just through the entire airline industry and, and in like like you take stones and put them in a tumbler to, to polish them that's what it was 
and, <clears throat> and again, you're dealing <clears throat> with a corporate structure that has never enjoyed that kind of freedom before. So there was no reasoned logic to some of the things that were done. And, and it caused, uh, you know, communities like us to lose air service. Let me ask you this about, I was going to ask about the commuter airlines. Um, you just normally had one at one time. Has that been, like, for instance, you had Air Wisconsin, then you had Brit, or have you had several in here? We've had several. Okay. In fact, there was, there was one year when we had, at most, three at a time. But that year, my statistics show that we had service from five different airlines. They came and went that way. And the big problem was they needed slots. Now, Lafayette was awarded two arrival slots and two departure slots in the O'Hare. We had been shuttling nine aircraft a day in there. Uh, all of a sudden, we didn't have the service. And so we went from our high point in 79 down like that on passenger boardings. <clears throat> we had one carrier come in that really looked it looked promising, and that was Piedmont. Piedmont had established a hub at Dayton. Now, the way the hubs worked, all their flights <coughs> would come in at a certain time period in the Dayton, and they'd all go out. And it was actually a pretty efficient way of doing things. What happened was U.S. Air bought Piedmont. Now, my personal feelings is the U.S. Air is the worst thing that ever happened to anybody, including us. They're the least efficient, least caring carrier there is, and they keep buying up everybody else. So... <clears throat> Then we had a U.S. Air commuter coming in, giving a service to Indianapolis. Well, that's ridiculous. And so they said, what hey, what? the Dayton one? Did they keep that? Or they, they cut the stuff to Dayton. Okay. We had a few flights to Dayton, and then everything shifted. Okay. And... Uh, I called a, uh, one of the VPs of uh, uh, U.S. Air that I had been acquainted with over the years, and I said, hey, what, what are you going to do? Here? Said, you're you're going to pull out of Lafayette. <clears throat> and his comment was, yeah, why put an airplane in Lafayette when they can drive to Indiana in an hour? And it's hard to argue with that. Uh, <clears throat> for, for years, the industry has had a standard that said, if <clears throat> the time is time to get to an airport is over an hour and a half, then you need service to another closer airport. Now, if we're talking about a general aviation airplane, one owned by a corporation, that time span now drops to maybe 35, 45 minutes uh, because these have these corporates have their airplanes so that they can get them when they want them so they can get in and out quick and no messing around. People are more tolerant on going to an airline. And they're becoming less tolerant. I, I will say that. <clears throat> With this two hours in advance uh, sort of thing. Uh, so there we were, and uh, the word gave out, came out that 
okay, here's a community that's got uh, two arrival and two departure slots to O'Hare, and we had a run of little carriers coming in, uh, none of whom were even marginally successful. Uh, the best uh, chance we had was uh, uh, with uh, one that was running as a partner with Air Wisconsin, uh, but that didn't last. Uh, so the air service, you know, just steadily went downhill. And for the researchers, there hasn't been any for several years at the Purdue Airport commercial. I think the last one left uh, probably 02. Something like that. 02, see something like yeah. in that. Uh, so they can't blame that one on me. I was already gone. <laughs> what about uh, some of the organizations that, that use that airport? Uh, does Lafayette Aviation, do they use that? Yes, Lafayette Aviation uh, is the, what we would, would term as the... Is it a private comp company? Yes, oh, private okay. organization. Okay. Uh, they are, in the industry, we call a fixed base operator. Now that's a term that goes clear back to the days of the Jenny, when you had the World War I pilots flying from farm field to farm field to farm field and giving rides. Well, they were, they were, they were operators, uh, airplane operators. And then, uh, you know, as the story goes, one of them marries a farmer's daughter and decides to stay there and he becomes a fixed base. Operator. <laughs> That's how these terms <laughs> evolve. I always like derivations, etymology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, so uh, we've we've had uh, actually three uh, fixed base operators on the airport. We had one, uh, two young men who wanted to start one, and uh, and they had more ambition than financial support behind them. And so they only lasted about uh, eight or nine months. And then we had uh, Reed Airways, uh, Chuck Reed, uh, who was an experienced uh, uh, aviation operator. And uh, Chuck ran uh, aircraft sales, service maintenance, and, uh, and did pretty well. But over the years, not quite to the extent he would have wanted. And uh, and then we got Lafayette Aviation with uh, Mick Pittard. Uh, his his uh, his son runs the local operation. Mick is out of Indianapolis, and he came up and he set up uh, the operation. Uh, eventually, it, all of this was in the hangar number five. Uh, they wanted to expand. And fortunately, PRF was willing to finance the structure, the hangar. And uh, so he moved in there, and they've done very well. They've done well for the community. Uh, a corporation can call and, and, and get a jet to go anywhere. Right. What about? Uh, the people that come in for the football games, they bring their own planes that they provide, they can still use the Purdue, Purdue Airport? Yeah. Okay. The, the fixed base operator, Lafayette Aviation, provides all service to transient aircraft. They provide the fuel, ground handling, maintenance, uh, all of that that any aircraft would want. If uh, they need uh, catering, they'll call a local caterer and uh, get the food and, and whatever the, uh, the, the aircraft operator wants. And uh, get back here. And uh, so they are, are what we term as a full service FBO. flight instruction, the works. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the only two elements they do not do are, are banner tow 
and agricultural spray. <laughs> so, uh, but they uh, they provide support for those operations when they come in to do their thing. Sure. Uh, and uh, it's been a, it's been a good operation. It was kind of a uh, an emotional and uh, difficult time because La Lafayette Aviation had the flight instruction, maintenance, aircraft sales. But at that time, the airport was still the vendor of all aviation fuels. Selling the fuel was the main income for the airport operation. Uh, we were, the airport was one of a group of organizations within the university referred to as service enterprises, which was transportation, printing, uh, central machine shop, uh, food stores. In other words, these were organizations which were supposed to derive enough income to cover their own expenses without delving into the university's main budget. Now, of course, most of them... Bring your own in income. Yeah. Right. Most of them, in fact, all of them, uh, essentially, uh, except for the airport, derived their revenue from other university organizations. Uh, we derive most of ours from outside. Uh, and it, it was an interesting group to work with because... You know, the, the ag school starts out at the beginning of the year and they've got this big pile of money. And all they have to do is make sure it lasts until June 30. With our organizations, we started out with nothing. And we had to earn everything we, we got. And in fact, if the airport made a surplus almost every year, in fact, uh, uh, and that had to go into a reserve fund. And it was the profit I might have made in 79, I could not use to start out 80, because that had gone back in the reserve. And when, when I left, the airport had a $700,000 reserve fund for capital improvements and that. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it made for an interesting uh, mm -hmm. financial and organizational situation. But my income was derived from that fuel service. Lafayette Aviation came to me, Mick Pitter came to me. He said, I cannot sustain my operation unless I can have the fuel. So he and I sat down and we used up a lot of sheets of paper and sharpened a lot of pencils and finally figured out what sort of a flowage fee the airport would need. Now a flowage fee is a fee that the airport takes from the fuel vendor to help cover some of their costs. So fueling the plane. And, uh, but no, the, the vendor's still fueling the airplane. This is, for example, um, uh, at, at O'Hare, <clears throat> all of the bulk fuel facilities are owned by the airport. And then the airlines go and pay so much to the airport for the fuel that they, they sell. Uh, so we had to have a certain flowage fee to cover the loss of the income from selling the fuel. And finally, Mick and I were able to come to an agreement. And he bought all of the fuel and equipment, uh, paid us so much uh, which uh, allowed him to put his fuel in our bulk facilities, and all of that was part of the flowage fee. So now we have a, a fixed base operator has full service, 
and it is doing quite well, I think. But that caused a PR problem for me internally. I had seven employees I didn't need anymore. I had no, nothing for them to do. They had an option of going with Mick. They chose not to. So I guaranteed them that they would not be hurt by this. And I called in personnel. And I said, I've got some people here who need jobs on the campus. And I want them to have good jobs. I don't want them to be hurt. And if you don't come, if you can't do that, you better come back bleeding. Because I was serious about it. Because these were good people. I mean, they had been with me 25 years, 20 years. Uh, they were good employees, they were loyal employees. Granted, uh, I used to get complaints from the VP all the time about the salary rates I was paying. I said, hey, go call personnel and ask them how many times they've had to find somebody for me. Well, that took care of that. You take care of your people, they take care of you. And uh, so that transition to uh, Lafayette Aviation uh, eventually worked out quite nicely and, uh, and enhanced uh, the service uh, available sure. uh, to the users. And uh, everybody appreciated that. And of course, the other user is a department of, for the research is part of aviation technology uses the airport. Yeah, aviation technology uh, provides most of the aviation activity if you're talking about landing and takeoffs. Uh, so it, it's the sort of thing where where I say, all right, let's. Let's take a look at the revenue from outside sources up here. Revenue from AFTEC is here. Mm -hmm. Activity, AFTEC is here, and the outside flights are down here. Mm -hmm. uh, just the opposite. Uh, the AFTEC operations have always been top notch. I'm happy to say that until my last or second to last year, we had never had a fatality on the airport. We did have one student aircraft, um, and we lost an instructor and two students, and it was it was uh, pretty devastating, uh, and it took that part of the airport community a while to recover from that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's first class operation. Uh, I have to admit I have never been a 100% supporter of the flight operation because Seldom have I seen a great need in the aviation industry for more pilots. Uh, we finish a war and all of a sudden you've got all the military pilots applying to the airlines. Uh, you've got a lot of schools in the country, Embry-Riddle, North Dakota, uh, Oklahoma, who are also graduating pilots. Now, few of them get the experience that the flight students here get because of the simulators uh, that we have. We've had donated or they've purchased. So the students uh, 
in that program can graduate having had uh, a fair amount of simulator time in a Boeing 737 or a 727 uh, in the simulator, which one would think would be of value. However, the airline industry operates on a seniority basis. And they don't care if you've got 100 hours in a 727 simulator. When you hire on with them, you're going to be in the right seat, the co-pilot seat, of a little commuter airplane. And you have to work up from that. So I, I guess that's why sometimes I question that program is because those students are being given advantages that turn out to be of no value. Yeah, for some period of time. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, ask you, the, um, when President Reagan came in 87. Sure. How was, yeah, what was the preparation for that? <laughs> was that the biggest planes that have ever landed in the Air Force, uh, Air Force One? Uh, the Air Force One. Because in my time, I don't remember a bigger plane coming in, but three more now. Yeah, I, I would have to check. Yeah, um, but one of them, if not, you know. Well, the we had two C-141 okay. cargo aircraft okay. came in in support uh, of the flights. And I don't know if they would have weighed more than Air okay. Force One or not. Okay. But... Uh, if if it wasn't the heaviest, it was number two. Sure. Uh, and because uh, Air Force One and Air Force Two came that day, didn't they? No, planes? Air Force Two didn't. Oh, just the Air Force One. Okay. Uh, we had a, a second airplane in, but that was carrying the press. Oh, okay. But it was a commercial okay. uh, carrier. We have had Air Force Two when uh, uh, when Dan, what's his name, was VP. Oh, okay. Air Force Two is the vice president's airplane. Right. Okay. Uh, whatever the president flies in is number one. If if it's when he takes off from the White House in that Coast Guard helicopter or Air Force helicopter, whatever it is, yeah. that is Coast Guard one. Okay. He, if if he gets in uh, one of the uh, Gulf Streams, it's Air Force one. Whatever the Air President is on becomes Air Force One. <laughs> okay. But, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, when the Presidents leave office, uh, took off from Washington as Air Force One, new President takes the oath. That aircraft immediately changes its call sign with air traffic control to 707121. It's no longer Air Force One. Yeah. I think I've read that in the, in the print. You know, they mentioned that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look at the charts and say strictly by the, the what the numbers say, Air Force One should not have landed here. The runway wasn't long enough. However, you have to recognize the fact that those guys up front in Air Force One are the best the Air Force has. And when they put the airplane down, uh, it was very close to the end of the runway and went on. They're good. Uh, they expect, they demand perfection. There was a lieutenant colonel who was in charge of military term as marshalling, but directing the aircraft to its parking spot, which was marked. Now, Air Force One is to arrive or depart within 15 seconds of the scheduled time. So the aircraft is coming in, not taxiing fast, because you can figure that the co-pilot's watching the clock, saying we've got this much time, this much time. And they come in, and the major who was directing the aircraft to the parking spot 
missed it that far. Everybody got off, and the aircraft commander got off, and he walked up, there, and that major got chewed up. You don't miss the parking spot that much. That was at least six inches <coughs> off. Okay. And that's the sort of perfection they require with Air Force Absolutely. One. Absolutely. There is no error. But working with the Secret Service, uh, was hard duty, but enjoyable duty. These men are professionals. They tell you what they need. If you can provide it, great. If you can't, okay, let's find another way to get this done. We, uh, we started working with the Secret Service 10 days before the arrival, and that's all I did for those 10 days. I had uh, one of the agents who was assigned to me, and uh, we just went over everything. If we park the aircraft here, it shielded from view more places. So that's where we ought to do it. The crowd is going to come in here. We'll have a fence line here so they can't get through. We're going to have a speaker platform here for the president. And you know, given that location, the ideal place for the two snipers, one is up in the control tower, one is on the top of Hangar 2. So they have complete field of view of everybody. And these guys are good. I mean, they'll, they'll guarantee that they'll... Uh, pick off a, a nickel at uh, 200 yards. And um, so we look, went from building to building. Okay, this door would have a view of the airplane. This door has to be locked. Sure. This door has to be locked. Uh, these windows cannot be opened. You know, the, the whole routine. And like I say, we took seven days. Telephone company brought in 100 lines for the White House. My office complex was the fallback site. If there's any problem, let's get the president in some place where he's secure. That was my office. Uh, you're doing all of this, and then the White House staff shows up. They are referred to as the political staff. That's the nice term. Now, they have different needs and ideas. We can't put the airplane here. This hangar blocks a lot of you. The airplane's got to be out here where the whole world can see him. So now the president is within view of anybody all the way out to State Street. So Secret Service calls the railroad would you please park a bunch of freight cars on the railroad north of the airport? Railroad says, no problem, we'll do it. They call the local police and they say, okay, add to your contingent five officers to station themselves on top of freight cars. Make sure nobody's coming through between the cars, trying to get over them. Okay. So the manpower goes up. But the White House staff is, is pleased because you know, it's all visible. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, then uh, they say, no. Now we're going to have concessionaires right, right in here selling pop, cup, whatever. I said, no, you're not. I said, I'm not going to have uh, candy wrappers and pop cups and all that blowing out towards Air Force One. You're going to restrict all of that to the parking lot. They said, well, we don't know if we'll do that or not. 
And he said, we'll go, we'll go talk to President Beering. I said, do you need his phone number? No, we've got it. So about an hour later, I get a call from Dr. Beering's office. It explained the, the issue that the White House staff wanted. I said, I'm sorry, this is a safety and security issue. I do not want that junk on the ramp around that airplane. And I said, that's why I've told them, no. Dr. Bering's office said, okay, huh? Good for you. no question. Mm. And uh, so, you know, the, the political staff, uh, of course they had to show their point at, before the president comes back to the airplane, they have the police officers and the firemen and that, and lined up. So when the president comes up, he can shake hands with all of them. They deliberately did not ask me to be in the lineup. And one of the uh, White House aides said, that, uh, we're just working with those who are cooperative. And I said, well, that's okay. I said, I, I had talked with and shook hands and chatted with, uh, at that time, Governor Reagan several years ago when he was here. So I said, we've met. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then next thing I know, <laughs> the uh, Secret uh, Service people came out, <clears throat> handed me a little bag. And inside were napkins from Air Force One, the guide to Air Force One, uh, all the things that the VIPs get when they go on Air Force One. And they said, there's a special cap in there. They said, but you can't wear it. And I looked at it, and they had given me one of their Secret Service caps <laughs> with the Secret Service <laughs> emblem on it. And uh, so the, the professionals were great to work with. They really were. And in fact, uh, the one I was working with after the vehicles had gotten here, uh, he said, well, would you like to go look at it? I said, well, yeah, I would. And my wife happened to be out for lunch that day. I said, it's okay if Jan comes? Sure. So we walked down and uh, another Secret Service agent stopped and I was just, hey, this is the airport manager. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we went down and uh, he opened the door and we, you know, the doors were that thick and, and you pull it to open it. Yeah. And uh, we were able to look inside the, his, his vehicles and and, uh, and uh, so, you know, the Secret Service were most appreciative of everything sure. that was done to help them because uh, we made it much easier for them. Right. And uh, they had a good working relationship. Yeah. It worked that well. Yeah. yeah. But like I say, with 10 days. Yeah. Uh, and when you see the amount of work and the expense that goes into uh, a two-hour visit by the president. It's, it's fantastic. Awards and honors, Sagamore of the Wabash. Tell Sagamore of the Wabash. Yes. When did you receive that? Well, at the time I was president of the Aviation Association of Indiana, which is a conglomerate group we used to have two. We used to have uh, the airport officials, Indiana airport officials, and then we had the uh, uh, Indiana Aviation Sales, which were the fixed base operators. <clears throat> we finally decided this is stupid. We ought to be one group. Yeah. So we formed the Aviation Association of Indiana. And uh, at this particular point, I had going from secretary to vice president to president. And we had accomplished the Aviation Association, uh, not me personally, but the group accomplished some 
significant facts. Uh, a, a lot of things were accomplished through the legislature that we had been needing. And uh, one of the big supporters of the aviation who was uh, an aviation uh, consultant and also uh, worked the halls of the State House. Uh, was happened to be a good friend of the governor. In fact, was the governor's, the governor was his best man at his wedding. One was a Republican and one was a Democrat. <laughs> but uh, they were good friends. And John said, gosh, you did good work on that this year. I said, well, look, you know, how many times was I there and how many times were the other guys? The association did a good job. So at our annual conference, uh, the S Secretary of State was the speaker. And as he finished, uh, he asked me to come up and gave me the Sagamore Award, which I announced and meant most wholeheartedly belonged to the whole group. You know, it wasn't mine. But, but uh, in a way, it was nice because at that time, the VP I reported to was so proud of having been made a Kentucky colonel. And when he found out I was made a Sagamore. <laughs> Got it. What up? <laughs> um, That's right. Yeah, you served also in the Greater Lafayette Chamber of Commerce, but the, you were the traffic and Traffic transportation and transportation and yeah, traffic, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, the chairman that, at one time. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was a chairman and division vice president uh, over the infrastructure area, which included uh, you know, sewage, uh, sure. uh, water, electricity, the whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> but probably the most significant job I had was uh, on the area plan uh, technical committee. Uh, it was called Technical Highway Committee. I objected to that. <laughs> You better call it Technical Transportation Committee. But they never did. It's Technical Highway Committee. And that committee was made up of representatives from the governmental organizations which received federal state funding for projects. And that committee had several duties. First of all, if, if you wanted a driveway into your sub shop off of State Highway 26, it had to be approved by that committee. Anything that had to do with state highways. Uh, we didn't concern ourselves with county or city. But if it would impact a state highway, our committee had to act on it. We also had to develop the uh, plan for the entire community for the major elements of development by either the, one of the cities or the county or the state or, in my case, aviation. Now, they, they may be the chairman because I was completely neutral. I had my own fund for aviation that they couldn't tap into, but here you've got four others sure. looking at the same pot wanting to pull out of it. So they say, okay, you're neutral, you're the chairman. <laughs> and, uh, Smart move. Huh? Smart move. You know. Sure. 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 Uh, and we would have a list of six, seven projects. Uh, that the various uh, governmental units wanted to do, and we might have enough money for two or three. Well, you have, you got to make a choice. And you have to make the choice on the basis of how much impact does that 
project have on the entire community? And uh, eventually, what it would come to, we would have a list. And I'd look up and say, well, anybody want to establish some priorities here? Not me. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> my priorities are the ones the mayor gave me, yeah. Um, I said, okay, let's take a look at this. And I would start the list. And uh, more often than not, they would go along with my suggestions because I tried to spread it, you know. But at the same time, maybe these two projects the county wants to do will have more impact on the community than, say, given the county two and Lafayette one. Sure. Uh, so it, it was not necessarily easy, but you just had to rely on, on your experience, your knowledge of the transportation system of, and in the area. And looking at it from both sides. That's right. Uh, and analyze it and think it through. Well, and you also have to look at who's got some money that they're not using. For example, on 231 going around, the best way to get a highway built is to put a bridge in the middle of it and build it. And then anybody who has any responsibility has to get a highway going to that bridge. We've done that several ways. We did one for the Hoosier Heartland. I've been on that committee for years. So we had the bridge built over the Wabash down there. And we were able to do that before the project was approved because the county had a big chunk of bridge funds. So the county built that bridge. And then that was counted for their participation in the whole rest of the project. So then it was up to the two cities to finance the rest of it. And so these are the things that you have to work out and, sure. and balance right. yeah. uh, to get the things done. And it took somebody who did not have a stake in that money right to say, okay, we'll use this as our priorities. Right. And well thought out. Sounds, sounds yeah. And it worked. Yeah, right. and it worked. It worked well. How about a, um, do you have a Purdue tradition? A Purdue. a Purdue tradition? Any tradition of Purdue that sticks in your mind, like maybe good athletics or, if not, how about a outstanding event? Evening. Well, the traditions, of course, were uh, go way back, and most of them, okay. most of them are gone. That's okay. Well, some of them are that people mention. I remember some of them, like yeah. the homecoming with the decorations of the houses, you know, and the oh, yeah. contest and the parade. Parade. Parade was a significant event. All right. Uh, the carnival the, the that used to be here for Grand Prix. Oh. The carnival that used to be here for Grand Prix. Yeah. But see, to me, that's recent. Well, yeah, that's true. Since I and and yeah, Grand Prix's true. reason. Yeah. I go back, uh, one of the things most in my memory was uh, a Purdue-Michigan State game when I was, I think, a junior. And Michigan State was, if not ranked number one in the country, they were right up there. And Purdue had no ranking at all. Well, sometime in the, I think it was the fourth quarter, Michigan State back fumbled the ball. And it was on about the 10 yard line down here, pretty close to the end zone. And a Purdue tackle picked it up and stumbled his way across the goal line. And Purdue won six to none. And that was such a victory. 
both goalposts came down. Uh, one ended up on the steps at Hovde Hall. The other one we carried across town to Dr. Hovde's house up at uh, 7th Street, I think. That big mansion yeah, there at the corner. Yeah, it used to be and Dr. Hovde came out. He said, I appreciate your effort. <laughs> but he said, if you'll take that back to the campus, anybody who attended the pep rally Friday night will not have to go to class Monday. So, the goalpost went back to the campus. <laughs> and of course, there was nobody on class Monday, even though probably only about 200 people were at the pep rally. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's one of the things you remember. Sure. The, the presidents. Dr. Hovde was one of the most gracious men I've ever met. Uh, he would come out, he'd be taking a flight on Lake Central, and he'd be out there half an hour, 45 minutes, and we had the sky room at that time, the cafeteria, and he'd get a cup of coffee or something else to drink and sit down at a table. And, uh, of course, the students are walking in and saying, oh, it's the president. There's the president, yeah. But at that time, I was on staff, and I had gotten to know his personality fairly well. And if he didn't look like he was working on anything serious, I would grab a iced tea or something, go sit down, chat. And... Uh, just chat about everything. He was a he was a real terrific guy. And I remember when he announced his retirement. I sat down at the table with him, and I said, "Doctor Hovde, I said, this is not going to feel right." I said, "You were the president when I was a student. You were president when I was on the staff." I said this is not going to feel right. And he looked at me and said, don't worry. He said, whoever they pick, the university will be fine. <laughs> you know, that's just the way he was. Right. Yeah. Uh, Art Hansen uh, was a, a very nice person to, to deal with. Uh, not as easy to work with as Dr. Hundy on a person-to-person -person basis. Uh, he went against my advice and got a pilot's license. <laughs> I, I told him, too. don't do that. <laughs> I said, it's like having a driver's license and driving around the block once a month and saying you're a safe driver. I said, you're not going to fly an airplane. you got staff that does that. <laughs> he says, well, it's something I want to do. Sure. Yes, sir. So, and, and Nancy Hansen, of course, was a fantastic person. Uh, Mrs. Hovde was a little tougher. Uh, she was not unfriendly, but she was not someone who warmed up to you quickly. Her manner was different. Yeah. Uh, the only time I had real close contact with her was during the student uh, uprisings and uh, the president was coming in on, the, on one of the university airplanes. And she called and she said, would you please have some security out the airport for the president? I said, done. Yeah. And I called headquarters and I said, I need two officers to hang her suits. And she came out. And she did come over and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, thank you very much. I feel much better now. I said, okay. But... Um, Nancy Hansen was just old shoe. I mean, she was she was great. Uh, the Beerings, I could not have asked for more support from Dr. Beering 
uh, we came up with a logo for the airport. Because the airport being known as Purdue University Airport, a lot of people thought only university people could use it. I wanted to change it to Purdue Airport. And I said, you know, I'm not taking a thing away from the university. The name is still there. And I sent that up, and Fred Ford said, this is not quite the time to bring that issue up for various reasons. He didn't tell me, and I didn't ask. Uh, so we held off on that. And we had the new terminal, and we had dedication, and I came up with the new logo. I didn't come up with it. Students over in art and design came up with it. It was a semester project for them. And I had to pick from about eight. Uh, and uh, Fred Ford showed up, and uh, I think uh, one of the other VPs showed up, and they kind of poo pooed that low rule. You know? Dr. Bering comes up, stops at the door, gets out, walks in. He says, I like that new logo. All of a sudden, every vice president in the place thought it was great. <laughs> you know, so he, w he was always fantastic to work with, and it's, it's still great. Anytime I see him, uh, uh, he'll wave or say, come on over and chat and talk. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a good president. A lot of people on the academic side had a problem with him. Everybody has their issues on the campus. Nobody gets everything they want. Mm, right. It's a give and take. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jiski, uh, I, I worked with for six months while I was trying to get rid of the airport. <laughs> uh, so I had very little contact with him and, or any need to. Uh, so my, my impressions of Dr. Uh, Jiski are very much neutral. Yeah. But uh, I, w I will say from Dr. Hubdi all the way up, uh, we've had fantastic support from the university uh, hierarchy. And uh, nobody could have asked for more, really. Um, I did uh, confuse uh, a chairman of the trustees once. Uh, he said, well, why do your federal grants have to be signed by Fred Ford or Ken Burns? And I said, well, because they have to be signed by an officer of the university, and the president is not an officer of the university. The president is an employee of the trustees. The airport belongs to the trustees, not the university. And he thought, well, that's right. <laughs> I guess that's right. Yes, but, but every time we had a new president, I had to explain why they could not sign for any of my federal grants. Right. Okay. Because that for some, you know, what do you mean I can't sign? I'm the president. The way it was set up, right? Sorry, sir. You're an employee, just like me. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're almost close. I'm going to leave it to you if you have anything that I forgot to ask or in summation. I hope we covered most of the things. Well. But I may have forgotten some things. No, I, I would say, you know, uh, quite possibly my comments about Avtech may be viewed as negative. Uh, they should not be. It's just oh, that I have... I I have uh, reservations about the need for the one program. Mm -hmm. The Avtech program has always been uh, fantastic and one that the university could be proud of. Sure. Uh, the maintenance students, uh, surprisingly, uh, they were in a program that calls for them to get their FAA maintenance certificate, and they do. But hardly any of them stop there. 
they go on and finish out their four years. Yeah. Well, and, that's the two-year program that associate. Two-year program. Okay. It's an associate program. But they can continue on and get their bachelor's, and they do. Mm -hmm. And these guys go out to work for the airlines. They're not on the floor working as mechanics. They're supervisors. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I've always been very proud of that program. It's, it's a good one. The flight students, without question, are, are the best trained available. I just question whether they need it. Hopefully. <laughs> whether there, whether there, there is a need that for that many Is there an more, opening for them to more, move into? Yeah. Right, when they finish. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, of course, we've got another program out there that it is not anywhere under my supervision, but School of Aeronautics Laboratory okay. is out there in Hangar 3, and that's that's one of the the the, the top aeronautic uh, research labs in, in the country. And I take visitors over there, I take them in to take a look at the model and the photographs of the Jan, John Hancock in Chicago. When they first built the John Hancock, they were having windows blown in. And nobody could figure out why. Well, these guys built a model of the Big John, and I don't know how many thousand little tufts of cotton on the various sides of it, and they put it in the window. And you see the wind comes across, and all of a sudden, halfway up, the tufts are going down. Halfway up, the tufts are going up. They were creating a vacuum on the side of the building. Which was causing that. You know, it's you know, at one point they blow a window out, and at another point they blow one in. It's depending on where the wind was coming from. Uh, so they replaced all the windows in that, in that building. Well, you know, that's, that's an example of where you, your research efforts reach out to the community and really pay off. Right, exactly. Know. And the aeronautics lab out there is a, is a very valuable. There's also a model out there of a Greyhound bus. If you look a little, take a look at some of the Greyhound buses, the rear end of them had a little hump on it. Because the wind tunnel studies showed that they were creating a vacuum at the rear end of the bus, holding it back. And they put that little hump on there, and all of a sudden the air went over just <laughs> like it was supposed to. So, you know, there are a lot of things going on at that airport that that people don't see, don't realize. Uh, and size-wise, uh, that airport, acreage-wise, is the same as the main campus, over 600 acres. Mm -hmm. if, and if you take our main runway and you start... At University Bookstore, it ends up at the president's house. <laughs> People don't realize the scale of that of that That's operation, good, yeah. but it's one I've always been uh, been proud of, and I was pleased I was able to make my career there. Right. Mr. Stroud, I want to thank you very much. Well, I very, appreciate the opportunity. Very, very nice.